I will present today what I presented last week at the IPSD conference. So it's a paper I prepared with my colleagues from uh, EDF, uh, Remy Portelemon and Alain Zemar, and a colleague from uh, Super Institute, Alberto Bertinato. The title is Implication of Faults on Insulation Coordination of Dedicated Metallic Return on Bipolar HVDC Overhead Transmission Lines. So the presentation today is a little bit expanded uh, to how we did it in EMTP compared to the one I presented last week. Uh, I'll first introduce you to the topic of uh, DMR and what is the problem with uh, dedicated metallic return. Then uh, DMR faults and uh, arc extinction mechanism. How did we model the system specifically in EMTP? Uh, then the study of practical solutions to eliminate the risk of permanent faults of DMR of a 320 kV DC overhead lines uh, we tried and some conclusions we had at the end of this study. So uh, to, to introduce you to, to a classical system, uh, which is a point-to-point -point, uh, bipolar system, uh, which we can see on the upper left figure. So we have two converters for each pole, a positive pole and negative pole. And then uh, as a return path, instead of earth, we are using a dedicated metallic return. In normal configuration, dedicated metallic return is solidly grounded on uh, one end, as you see on the left side, and then uh, grounded through some grounding apparatus on the other end, because we need a, a voltage reference uh, at one point in the system. Uh, all new lines uh, in Europe are supposed to have a DMR conductor in the future. This is due to different aspects. Some of them are en environmental concerns, new regulations, and N minus one benefits, meaning that uh, N minus one, when we lose, for example, in case of a oh, sorry, uh, fault on a positive pole, DMR should uh, not be impacted by this fault. It should stay intact, the insulation and the conductor itself. And then we should be able to continue the uh, operation of the negative pole and the return of current to DMR. So we lose only 50% of the capacity of the system. Uh, it's important to say that in normal operation, positive and negative pole currents are uh, almost perfectly balanced. So the current through DMR is zero and voltage uh, uh, drop across the DMR is close to zero. But in case of uh, uh, monopolar operation, the full current current goes through DMR, so the voltage is equal to the voltage drop along the conductor. And uh, what I said that bipolar system stability and security depends on the reliability of DMR during and after fault events. So it means that in case of a fault on either of the pole, we need to keep DMR uh, operational. Uh, why is it a problem? You can see a figure on the top right. Usually uh, pole conductors are quite long. Uh, and uh, poor, uh, pole insulators are quite long compared to DMR. And DMR is usually uh, insulated only to the voltage it sees as a voltage drop across the DMR. And then we see this as a weak link of the system and uh, we are trying to look at how does this uh, short insulation behave uh, during uh, different faults and uh, over voltages. So this paper then studies the behavior extinction of arc on insulators of a DMR conductor and practical solutions to limit the risk of permanent faults. So uh, what faults can cause uh, voltage or uh, outage of both uh, pole insulation and DMR insulation constantly? Uh, if this happens, the DMR insulation fault will be supported by the DC current and will turn into a DC arc, which is uh, which we don't want. So two of these events, one is uh, pole, during pole to ground fault, due to instance for pollution on a positive pole, for example, slow front over voltages of several hundred kilovolts are induced on the DMR. And if it's installed for medium voltage, then of course, you're going to have a flash over either uh, on the surface of the insulators are consequence of wetting of, of, of pollution or between the two arcing horns. And you can see a typical DMR insulator on the right hand side. And second, event are lightning strikes strikes that cause a pole to ground insulation flashover and also they cause a DMR ground to, uh, DMR to ground fault. This is a little bit specific because if a flashover occurs only in the DMR insulation uh, in bipolar mode, DC current in DMR is too low so, to support the permanent arc, so it will just extinguish itself. And uh, flashovers due to shielding failures are rare on the poles. Therefore, the lightning performance of the pole insulation is equivalent to back flashover performance. And uh, we calculated in this paper for poles, it's close to zero. On the other hand, for an example of a ground uh, flash density of one lightning stroke per kilometer square per year, back flashover rate of uh, DMR is uh, six per year per 100 kilometers, which is significantly higher than the pole. In 
this paper, since lighting is so specific, we decided to uh, concentrate on the uh, slow front over voltages due to pole to ground faults on uh, positive or negative pole. So that's why the number one option is circled. To model the system, we use the EMTP 4.2.1. Converter rating is uh, one gigawatt. Voltage is uh, plus minus 320 kV, and the current is around two kilo amps for the base case. And the molded line was 300 kilometers long. As I said in the second slide, the HVD system configuration is bipolar with a dedicated metallic return. Converter used are the generic EMTP VSC MMC models. Uh, we set up that the left side converter or the, like the sending end regulates voltage and the receiving end is regulating active power because we always need one master and one slave uh, in a point to point or multi terminal. Uh, the discharge gap length between two uh, arcing horns uh, for the pole insulators is six, uh, 4.65 meters and uh, 0.6 meters for DMR insulators. You can see there is a significant difference in the length. Uh, these spark gaps are modeled with flashover switches uh, and required withstand voltage used was 340 kV for DMR, meaning that if over voltage on DMR is higher than 340 kV, the, the uh, Flashover switch will flash over. You can see how we model this in the MTP in, a, in one or two slides. And then for poles, it was a, a 1595 kilovolts for uh, pole spark gaps. To simplify the line, uh, we use four spans on each side of the fault location. The rest of the line is presented with frequency dependent line models. We also built a detailed line, which you will see the comparison of detailed and simplified line uh, in the next slides. So how did we build this? If we zoom in next to the fault, so in the middle, we see uh, this red box represents the faulted tower. Uh, then we have the tower model, and then we have the spans on each side. So it's a tower, span, tower, span. And uh, we have four spans on each side. Span is 500 meters long. If we zoom inside this one of these boxes, the tower model looks like this. We, we compared and we didn't more, need a more complicated tower model. So we have connections for two poles, then a DMR and a, a shield wire. We model the whole tower impedance by uh, one impedance, which is then controlled in the mask. And then these spark gaps are set up to the voltages I previously showed. So if you zoom out, what I presented is in this box on the right hand side, which says faulted tower with surrounding spans and towers. Then if you neglect all these uh, scopes, uh, we have a FD line model on the left which is, uh, for example, 150 kilometers. You want to simulate the fault at the middle of the line. Then uh, we have, uh, I don't know, this is a mistake, faulted tower. Uh, on the left, we have the, uh, the line termination tower. And then uh, we have the VSCMMC model with AC system equivalent. So if you want to change the location of the fault along the line, it, here it says other side is symmetric. We have the, in the middle, we have the, the tower model and surrounding spans and then on each side we have an fd line and then we just change the length of this line so if you want the fault to be for example 50 kilometers from the beginning we put the left fd line model to 50 kilometers we put the right hand side uh, fd line model to 250 kilometers and this way we can slide the fault along the line uh, so to model the system uh, we first what we did we presented the whole line with uh, uh, towers and spans because we wanted to look at where does the fault happen. So in this case, uh, as you can guess, with a lot of elements, uh, there was a, it took a lot of time to do the simulations, and then we can compare it to the simplified uh, version with, which I just presented on the previous slide, and this is the comparison of the wave shapes we see. So on the figures on the top. The solid line is the simplified model, and the dashed line is uh, where we present all towers and spans. And you can see that uh, it's quite representational. There is some peaks uh, which are uh, sh which show up in simplified model, and it's more smooth in the detailed model. So from our point of view, uh, if there are these peaks, it only means that our result results are more conservative, but but not by a lot. Uh, what I mean by not by a lot is that peak uh, value of the voltage at the fault location is only 4.1% higher. And at the end of the simulated line is 3.6% higher. So for us, this was an acceptable mistake. And to give you an idea of how, what is the time saving, for, for example, for a 100 kilometer line, the simulation time was nine minutes for a detailed model and two minutes and 39 seconds for the simplified one. And this was on a normal, uh, laptop uh, with the i5 processor. 
time step was set to one microsecond because we have this 500 meter span so we need a very small time step and the simulation time was of 800 milliseconds so then uh, we went to study on the practical solutions once we had the model that we were confident in so the first uh, was the fault was moved along the line and by this we tried to find the most critical point with the higher, highest over voltage and we found that it's around three quarters of the line at the beginning, since the left side is solidly grounded, the fault, uh, if the fault happens close to the beginning of the light, the over voltage is quite small. So the more we go towards the end of the light, the more critical it is. So for the uh, rest of the simulations, we chose the middle, three quarter and end of the line fault. And then uh, in the second step, we dimensioned the surge arrestor, and then we looked at what is the impact of the properly dimensioned surge arrestor on these over voltages. And the results you can see on the right hand side. So with solid lines, we have middle uh, three quarters and end, uh, full, uh, end of the line faults uh, without surge arrestor. And you can see in all three cases, we have a flash over. It reaches 340 kilovolts uh, and then, oops, sorry. And then it flashes over. So it means we have a fault on the DMR. In the dashed lines, you can see the same fault locations, the same system, but with implemented surge arrestor and none of these locations flash over. So it means that surge arrestor efficiently prevents flash overs. Uh, so now once we have the, the means to limit the flash over, we wanted to also, if the fault happens in, in any case, to, ex to be able to extinguish this fault. So, uh, uh, sorry, a uh, little bit more uh, about the surge arrestor. So uh, to make sure that uh, all these specifications of the surge arrest are respected and that the energy absorbed is not too high, we had to look at the energy uh, absorbed. So we took a power scope and then we uh, integrated in the scope view to look at what is the power absorbed during fall to ground fault and it was below 1.3 megajoule. And uh, 130 kV is well above the steady state voltage, which was in our uh, base case, 17 kilovolts of the DMR in asymmetrical monopolar operation, meaning that it will conduct only significant disturbances. So it means that the, this dimension of surge arrestor won't interfere with the operation of the system. And here you can also see the implementation of, uh, of the switch, which we used as a means of uh, fault extinction. So this, uh, this is the next slide, what next, uh, next slide is about. So we added it in parallel to have an option to extinguish the fault and uh, our assumption in modeling this switch was uh, that the fault identification algorithm needs one millisecond to identify the fault and additional one millisecond uh, to close the switch. So it means that the wave arrives in the station and then after two milliseconds, the uh, high speed switch is closed. On the right hand side, you can see that two milliseconds is not fast enough to prevent. So this case was simulated without the surge arrestor just to show the influ influence and the ability of a high speed switch. So uh, it shows that the high speed switch cannot prevent the flash over, but uh, when it closes, the voltage goes to zero. So it means it can help us extinguish the fault. And uh, during the fault uh, extingu uh, extinguishing or the process of eliminating a disturbance of the DMR, with the switch closed, there will be a current flowing to the ground. And uh, it's important to say that this is subjectable to regulations depending on the country and the region. So then uh, we took a look at what does the, this switch do uh, when the fault happens. So uh, left, -hand si left hand side uh, curve presents what happens for a positive pole to ground fault and with the DMR current at the end of the line. So the blue curve shows uh, the fault current without the switch and the red one shows the uh, current uh, with the switch. So it means that the switch can significantly reduce, reduce the current through the DMR itself, but to provide a additional ground return path. For the middle of the line, what you can see here, it's uh, 8.7 kiloamps decreased to 5.4 kiloamps. And for three quarters of a line fault, it was from 9.8 to 5.4. For the end of the line fault, uh, high speed switch is not really effective because it's too close to the fault location. And then it just offers alternative path and current will always go to the least resistive way. So it's not very efficient in this case. And then on the right hand side, we wanted to look uh, to have an idea about the switch rating. So we looked at what is the uh, current through speech, uh, switch itself in case of faults. And we can see that the highest current is around eight kilo amps for three quarters of the line fault. 
and then middle and end folds have approximately the same currents. So some conclusions. Uh, to ensure the independent and reliable operation of DMR, great care needs to be paid uh, to the coordination and understanding of a lot of different aspects during uh, the line design, and some of which are co covered in this paper. So a surge arrest position at the receiving end can greatly limit the slow front over voltages and effectively prevent DMR flashover. And a high-speed switch implemented in parallel with the surge arrestor can significantly reduce the current in the fault path. Uh, the duration of inert current in full state is subjectable to regulations, and unwanted influence on the surrounding infrastructure and environment needs to be avoided. Uh, additional component, uh, this, yes, the high-speed switch is an additional component with its reliability and the required activation and automation. So the, for example, uh, example of this regulation is uh, current can go through ground for, for a one second in the, and it can be two kiloamps. So it, it again, I say in Europe, it depends still on the country. There are no standards, but uh, we expect new standards to come out. And then the, the main conclusion of the paper is a combination of surge arrest as a fault limiting device and a high speed switch as a fault clearing device has to be meticulously designed and coordinated in DMR protection, but uh, probably both are necessary. And there could be some additional ways to decrease further this over voltages happening. So we don't have to uh, extinguish them. So this is all. Uh, this is all, and uh, I'm ready for your questions. Okay, thank you, Domagori, for uh, this presentation. Uh, now, the attendees, uh, if you would like to ask a question by voice, uh, you could raise the hand, and we will unmute you temporarily. So. Uh, we can do it this way. Otherwise, you could send your question in the Q&A box. So let's wait a little bit. For the questions to arrive. Uh, okay, while we are waiting for uh, other people to ask questions, I. Again, uh, have uh, another question. Uh, yeah. So um, I would like to know uh, how were the uh, converters modeled, the MMCs? So what kind of uh, uh, model did you use uh, there? Yeah, we used uh, the classical EMTP model. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, I mean, I mean, um, yes. yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, well, um, in this MMC model that you have uh, on the screen, I think you have the option of four different uh, types. So the average value model, then, you know, arm equivalent, detailed equivalent. Uh, which one was? It's a, it's a mo model type three. So I think it's an average uh, arm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah, so... Uh, Okay, and uh, the converter was it uh, blocked during? Um, uh... Yeah, the converter converter blocking was disabled because uh, mm -hmm. on negative pole we didn't have enough uh, over voltage to block the converter, mm -hmm. and on the positive pole once it's faulted we assume that uh, it's blocked. So this con we don't look at positive pole, so it was not of a concern for us. What could mm -hmm. be? added to add complexity or like precision to the system would be uh, uh, DC circuit breakers because in overhead lines uh, we know we cannot use half bridge converter model only uh, on overhead lines yeah. instead of case of half bridge we would need to add the, the uh, DC circuit breakers then we would have uh, the probably additional over voltage there so mm -hmm. yes. okay thank you 